lot of information. Um, so in some of it, because of time, I will probably go through fairly fast. But I really want at the end to get to some questions and answers that you guys have, because that's the funnest and most important part. So cycling in health, just a little bit about myself. I can to talk to you tonight about cycling into health. So I have over 20 years of experience as a woman's health nurse practitioner. I'm from Omaha, Nebraska, and um, I work at two places, actually. I work at the St. Paul VI Institute in Omaha, Nebraska. Some of you might know that as the foundation of the Creighton model system. It's also the foundation of um, NAPRO technology, which is the women's health science developed out of the St. Paul VI Institute. And I've been there for the last 20 years. And in 2012, I started in a family practice clinic called Bronco Familia Medical, and I'm actually converting most of my practice there now. Um, I work to treat the root cause of disease in women's health, and um, I'm super passionate about that. I love treating young women especially with PMS, PCOS, thyroid dysfunction, all sorts of things um, related to women's health. my family, uh, just so you get to know a little bit about me personally. I've been married for the last 20 years and I have eight children. Um, you might know one of my children, the oldest of my bunch, in the middle there is Anna Ken. And Anna's a sophomore here, so shout out to Anna. And uh, the only other girl I have is Rachel Kenny, and Rachel is also here with me tonight. She's 12, although she's taller than her sister Anna. So <laughs> you might not recognize that she actually is a 12 year old. Um, and then I have six boys, Isaac, Jude, Brendan, Daniel, Fulton, and Joshua. And uh, we have a crazy life, fun family, and that's uh, uh, us at our last family vacation. And in August of this last year, 2020, I started a podcast called The Hormone Genius. And this has been super exciting. And you can see um, my shirt that I'm wearing, hormones are cool. We're raffling off some of those shirts tonight. So just for coming here tonight, you have a chance to get a hormones are cool t-shirt. So that's fun. Um, and we're super excited. This is my co-host, Jamie Rachi, And he, uh, we uh, started this kind of, uh, you could say, as a Holy Spirit moment. Um, after doing this for the last 20 years and teaching students for the last 20 years, doctors, nurse practitioners, physician assistants, I really knew that this is something that a lot of people deserve to know, and a lot of people listen to podcasts, so I, I contacted this young woman, Jamie Rachi, and we started the Hormone Genius Podcast. We're on our 23rd episode, and hopefully you guys can just pick that up and access it. I have some cards for it. It's all simple, beautiful information about all the stuff that I'm passionate about. All right, so I believe true empowerment as a woman comes with you understanding the beauty and complexity of your own female design. And if you don't connect to your own female design, there's a disconnect your whole life with how your, your body works, with how your woman's health works. And what I found is over the years, so many women who did not know this information, when they come to me, oftentimes for years, they've had absolutely no understanding about how their their natural fertility works, how their woman's cycle works, and so they cannot advocate for their own personal health issues because they had no foundation in their own body. And so this is truly what I believe is true empowerment. So all too often women go through their whole lives without learning this information, and they don't realize that the menstrual cycle is actually a vital sign of health, just like a doctor reads your blood pressure or your respirations or your heart rate. The menstrual cycle is actually a vital sign of your health. And as a young woman, you really deserve to have this basic information so that you, know, you can make healthy decisions throughout your entire reproductive life. And all of this is stuff that doesn't get taught in sex education, right? 
we don't learn the basic foundations of really how male and female fertility works. We don't learn about the natural biological markers of ovulation. We don't learn about the hormones and how they affect you and your body. We don't learn about natural ways that you can actually learn eventually to either achieve or avoid pregnancy. We don't learn about authentic feminism or masculinity in sex ed. Sex ed tends to be kind of um, reduced down to risk mitigation. This is what you do, this is what you don't do, this is what you don't want to have happen to you. Instead of starting with the actual foundation of understanding how your body works and the gift of how your body works. We won't talk a lot about men tonight, because mostly a woman's body, but I do like to make sure you understand that there's a big difference between how a woman's body is made and how a man's body is made in terms of their fertility. So we're just gonna quickly go through male fertility. Um, these are just fun facts about male fertility. Each male produces 500 billion sperm from the testes in their lifetime. I just find that like a mind blowing. Um, the male testicles are inside the male body, which is different than women, and they descend just a few weeks before they are born onto the outside of their body. And men become fertile at the age of 12, and will be fertile literally until they die. So their fertility is a very, very long-lasting one and is on a daily basis, which is very different than women. So again, male versus female fertility, just understanding these key differences between men and women is very important. Boys have the power to be fertile, again, from the time they go through puberty until the point that they, are, um, they die. Men are born with their reproductive cell, the sperm, and they begin to produce that on a daily basis once they go through puberty and will continue until the end of their life. Men are fertile all of the time, so they're able to reproduce and participate in creating life up until a very old age. Men will um, give this reproductive cell to the woman during intercourse. This cell will produce a unique DNA called a new human being. And girls are different, so girls are born with the reproductive cell, um, the ovum or egg, which begins to release when they start their menstrual cycles um, on what we call menarche, the first period. Women will be, will be fertile for a very short period of time. And the egg is only released once in a cycle and will live for 24 hours. And women have a reproductive lifespan that's different than men. Their fertility begins at menarche when they start their period and ends at an average age of about 50. Women receive the reproductive cell from a man and her reproductive cell, the egg, will join again to create this unique human being. There's rise to the world. Okay. So a crash course on fertility appreciation. So we go back to the very beginning. How does this all start? And this is true for men and women. Your main and first and foremost reproductive sex organ is your brain. So everything starts in the brain. And it starts through what we call a pacemaker or messages that the brain sends to the reproductive system. This happens between the ages of 8 to 14 when the pituitary gland in the brain activates the fertility pacemaker. And this is the main me messenger that continues to pulse out a message every 60 to 120 minutes, literally every day as a woman. Every hour to two hours, your pituitary gland sends a message to your ovaries. And it's telling it what it's supposed to be doing at that time of the cycle. And once this pacemaker is established, then the two main hormones that a female produces, progesterone and estrogen, start to be established as well. And this is what starts puberty. So this is the changes in the body. Most of you are you know, aware of what happens in puberty, but you start again, first and foremost, as a pacemaker, which I think we forget about that part. Then the bodily changes begin. Why? Because your body is reacting to the pacemaker hormones and starting this development. So women start to develop in their body, and then they continue to change um, as they continue to grow, you know, grow in height, increase fat around the hips and thighs, breast development, pubic hair, all of those things that we know happen through puberty. And then in stage four, we notice something new. Before the actual period, and this is kind of the key part I think we all miss when we go through education and development of our bodies. But before a woman develops her first period, she will notice a discharge, a, 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 a vaginal discharge that occurs and this will be the very last sign she will see before she starts her menstrual cycle. And when I say that, I mean in the months to two months to three months before her actual period starts. And a lot of young women go their whole lives not knowing if that stuff is normal 
and wondering if anybody else has it too. Um, it's the key thing that, that never gets talked about. So the last stage um, is ovulation. It is what causes periods to happen. It's the main event. The sign of ovulation is the cervical mucus or discharge or fluid, however you want to call it. And it is um, at that point that a woman is able to conceive a child as soon as she starts her period and starts this cycling. So again, the mystery of the symptom you never knew, the cervical mucus is essential for your cycle. It's natural, it's normal, everybody has it. When we start talking about it, every woman knows that. And why does it happen? Because it's essential for basically um, sperm to survive. So we like to say it takes three things to make a baby. It takes a sperm that comes from the man, it takes an egg that comes from the woman, and it's essential for there to be cervical mucus present for a baby to occur. And that's because sperm have what? A head and a tail and they swim. And you can't swim in a pool with no water. So sperm have to have the swimming medium to get to the egg to be able to fertilize it. So it is the third ingredient. No mucus means no baby. So menstruation, again, this process, you know, it's, it's the after event. It's the shedding of the lining of the uterus. Why is it shedding? Because a baby didn't happen. So it has to restart the process all over so that you have another opportunity each month to be able to reproduce. Um, and from the age of 12 to 15 um, is when it generally starts, but we've noticed, of course, that periods are starting earlier and earlier for girls, and it ends at about the age of 50. In general, when we talk about a menstrual cycle, especially when we're talking about the parameters, we refer to a 28-day cycle. But we know that women actually don't have a 28-day cycle very often. That's only the median or the average. So 50% of women will have less than a 28-day cycle. 50% of women will have greater than a 28-day cycle. And there's a variation of that for every woman that occurs. But in general, when we talk about the cycle, we refer to it as a 28-day cycle. All right, so main phases of the cycle. So we have four of them as women. So we have menstruation. The first phase is menstruation. That's, again, the shedding of the lining of the uterus. And that happens over a period of three to seven days. Um, then the follicular phase. The second phase of the cycle, so again, your brain is sending this message. The lining sheds off. And all of a sudden, there's a recruitment phase. The recruitment phase is to get a follicle to be produced. The follicle itself is not the egg, we kind of can get confused, but it is the cyst that holds the egg. Every month, a woman makes an ovarian cyst. We hear a lot, a woman will get an ultrasound, they're like, oh, they told me I had an ovarian cyst. Eight times, nine times out of ten, that ovarian cyst you saw in an ultrasound was just the functional cyst that was occurring during the cycle, completely normal. So every month, your body makes a cyst. And that cyst grows on the ovary, and it grows to be about two centimeters in diameter at its maturity, but right before it's gonna release that egg that's trapped inside. And then ovulation, again, this is the main event. The only reason why you have a period is ovulation. I like to you know, help girls remember, yes, the period is what we think about as a main event, but it's not. Ovulation is, and ovulation happens 13 days before your period will start. So this main event of the cycle is that release the egg, and this is how, um, Right around ovulation, you're making a surge, another surge in the brain called LH. And LH allows for the, the ovary and the follicle to respond and to release that trapped egg in the process of rupturing it out called ovulation. And then, as that egg, egg is ruptured out, it's grabbed by the end of the fallopian tube, which has these finger-like projections on them called fimbria. And these are like incredible fimbria are. And they capture the eggs, uh, the egg, it could be two eggs, and then it travels down the fallopian tube to try to meet a sperm. Um, most of the time, of course, the sperm isn't there, and so it's going to just enter into the uterus and then and leave the body naturally. The fourth phase of the cycle is the luteal phase. The luteal phase begins after ovulation, and this is when the egg has been released, and that cyst on the ovary now collapses on itself and becomes a completely different structure. We call it the corpus luteum. It stands for a yellow body. 
and it produces a hormone called progesterone. And this hormone is what prepares the uterus for a new life to be implanted there. This is the progestational hormone. All right, what are your hormones doing in your everyday life? So these lovely hormones that a woman creates are amazing, and unlike a man, your hormones, you know, overall, the body goes through dramatic changes, ups and downs, start to finish. The purpose of these hormones are to prime the body with our creative power, we could say, and our feminine genius. The hormones supply health, vitality, beauty to the female body, and they are their, our essence of our connectedness to life. Hormones can make us feel like we are on a hormonal roller coaster. The ride of this hormonal roller coaster Roller coaster can be exciting, it can be scary, it can be uncomfortable, but the key is gaining confidence in where you're at. So, as a woman understands the process of her cycle and understands how this whole thing works, then we understand why we feel the way we do at certain times of the month. Men are very different. So, men's hormones are like this they have a, you know, their testosterone levels are high in the morning and they slowly kind of just come down slightly throughout the day. But they don't go through dramatic changes. They make one hormone and they're like this. This is different than women. Women have this up and down and they have you know, the, the complex of multiple hormones interacting with each other to create a symphony of process to lead to potentially, again, this creative power of creating life. So estrogen. Estrogen is your, I call it like the beautifying hormone for women. It's, make, it's what makes your skin glow, it makes your hair feel better. Have you ever noticed there is a time in the month where you actually feel like you look better? Like your skin clears up, you just feel like your hair looks better on that day. You feel a confidence about yourself that you didn't feel a week ago, two weeks ago. I guarantee you, you're probably in your estrogen phase. And this is what, again, not only does it give us our creative powers and our feminine genius, but it's also what attracts the opposite sex to you. Your hormone estrogen actually is released as a what we call pheromone onto your skin. And they've done studies in bars with men and watching men and women and how they interact. Men will be attracted to women who are ovulating and less attracted to women who are on birth control. Because women on birth control do not have an increase in estrogen that's natural and high that we do when we're ovulating. So this is your gift to create a natural attraction of, women, of men to you, this beautiful hormone of estrogen. And it's when you have energy, it's when you're going to be able to tackle kind of your, your studies, all of these things. It's the right time to go out and, and get it. Get it done, be a leader, all those things. Progesterone. Progesterone is a different hormone. I love progesterone more than anything. Um, it's the most important hormone in so many ways because it's what makes human conception possible in terms of its ability to maintain life. Progesterone is, um, its job again is to prepare the life of the, the new life in the womb to be able to implant there. It thickens it up, it provides a blood supply, um, and also raises the body temperature. This is why people can use um, body temperature to actually correlate and determine where they are in their cycle because progesterone is thermogenic. It raises the body temperature a half to a full degree. After ovulation, progesterone is higher than estrogen, and this is what we call the luteal phase. And when women are out of balance with these hormones, this is why sometimes they start to feel certain things like PMS. And progesterone is the, it's, it's honestly like you think about it kind of as a pregnant woman, it's the time of the month where a lot of times you want to be kind of internal, like you want to home at that time. You want to get things done, but you're quieter. Um, you feel like kind of being inward a little bit more. The body is literally preparing for potential new life. So as a woman, even though you're not conceiving at that time, it's still the hormone that makes you feel like you're preparing for something. And so it's a time when sometimes we are feeling different than we were when we're in our estrogen cycle. So understanding your cycle is a vital sign of health. What's normal versus abnormal? Again, this is so important to see your cycle, and you know this. Like, I mean, who doesn't get worried if they don't have their period for six months or if they're bleeding two times in a month? You know, all of these things we recognize that could be off in our cycle may relate to how we feel and also relates to our women's health. And your body shows you these outward physical signs. 
the more you're able to track these and be very in tune to them, even chart them, the more likely you are, again, to be empowered to advocate for what you do about that knowledge. So the awareness of your fertility. So there's several signs that your body as a woman makes to tell you where you are in your cycle. Several signs that we can see visibly or we can track. The most easy and visible sign that a woman has to determine where she is, or to determine basically the main events of the cycle, is that cervical mucus. It's easily seen when you go to the bathroom, that's the most obvious time to kind of notice it, check for it. Um, is when you're wiping, you'll see not only mucus on the tissue, but there's a sensation there that you can pay attention to. You might feel more wet, it might feel more slippery when you wipe. The second sign is body temperature. So again, we know that in your first half of your cycle, the estrogen is very high, but your body temperature is lower. Your body temperature, by the way, is not on average 98.6. That's a common <laughs> Your body temperature is actually usually in the 97s, um, and it only actually goes above 98 for most women after ovulation, in that luteal phase of the cycle. So once a woman releases that egg and she makes progesterone, her body temperature again will raise at least a half degree. And this, um, again, can be tracked, basically what we call basal body temperature tracking. The last thing that a woman can do is actually track this LH hormonal surge. And there are women who use this using a monitor, and they measure this surge using strips that they can, you know, can use with urination. And that can be tracked right around ovulation with regular cycles. So again, estrogen is this key hormone for our fertility, and it gives us the most obvious sign. Um, a lot of times we refer to it as looking like egg whites um, because it does. When it's at its peak, when it's at its most fertile, when your body is releasing that egg, a lot of times it will look like egg whites. Um, and so that helps kind of give a visual of what it's like. And it's the vital sign that tells you that your hormone levels are normal. Because if your hormone levels are not normal, sometimes women don't make this mucus or don't make a lot of it. So it's also a sign of what's healthy in the menstrual cycle. So I like to imagine it like a biological clock. So again, you have your period, and you know, your period lasts for about a week, maybe a little bit less. There, in that next week after that, there's this faucet that turns on in our body. And that faucet turns on purely because of the hormone estrogen. And as it turns on, you start to make this mucus, and it almost increases, like the faucet turns up as the estrogen levels go higher, and then all of a sudden it disappears. And it disappears because of the counteraction of the hormone progesterone. So progesterone literally dries up the mucus. And then after you basically stop that mucus, you can note to that day, on that day, you will start your period within 12 or 13 days exactly. And for every woman, it's the most stable event that will ever happen in your body. You ovulate, you will start your period always the same amount of days after that point. When you ovulate is very different, but from the point of ovulation to your next period, always the most stable event in your body. At least it should be if it's normal. And this is all because of you, the cervix. So women who don't, you know, maybe you're not as familiar with anatomy, but you might hear about the cervix because of pregnancy, because we talk about cervical dilation and when women are pregnant and they're going to give birth. But the cervix has a vital sign well before and outside of labor and delivery because in the cervix are these glands called crypts, cervical crypts. And these crypts are very sensitive to the hormonal changes in our body. And they're particularly sensitive to estrogen. So as estrogen rises with ovulation, it makes this good mucus to create these swimming channels that you can see um, here with the estrogen type of mucus. There's these swimming channels, so the, literally the sperm are going straight up into them. And these swimming channels are so delicate and so important, and there's multiple types of them, that they will literally weed out bad sperm. Your sperm has got a big head, it's not getting through. Your sperm got two heads, not getting through. Your sperm's got a defective tail that doesn't swim right, it's not gonna go through. So it literally, in the woman's body, is protective to procreation by filtering out sperm that are not healthy, so that the right sperm travel up to get to the egg. And again, after progesterone starts being made, literally that mucus is going to dry up, and that mucus will create a barrier, a literal barrier against any sperm. So you have a natural 
kind of mechanism to create fertility and its openness and infertility and its impossibility of conception. So the, it's all about determining then the fertile window. And again, the easiest way to do this is because it's the most kind of apparent and we don't need any tools to do it, is washing the cervical mucus. And it's this discharge again, when you go to the bathroom, you can see when you wipe. And just so you know kind of how it all goes again, we use this kind of like cyclic, um, you know, uh, graph to tell us kind of the whole thing. So again, you have your period, three to seven days. About a week later, or on what we would say is about day 10, 11, you'll start making the cervical mucus. And again, this is assuming you have a regular cycle. It increases over about three to five days. So you have about three to five days of mucus on average. And again, when I say this, this is just average. You could have 10 days of mucus for you. You could have two days of mucus for you. You could have 15 days of mucus. But this is just average kind of what occurs. And so three to five days um, of mucus. And then after that period of time when that egg is released, then you have an entire period of dryness again, about 12 to 13 days. Again, the most stable event until your next period starts. And it's the process of, um, you know, again, so I guess the question to ask maybe at this point would be like, what is fertile then and what is not fertile? Like how does conception occur within this? Because an egg, once it's released, only lives for 24 hours. So you're not fertile all the days you have mucus really, but there's a window there. And that's because sperm survive three to five days. So in good cervical mucus, sperm can hang out. And then they can hang out. Literally, you could have intercourse five days before you conceive. Because the sperm can hang out in this good quality mucus, wait for this egg, and get their chance to fertilize it. So that's why this window of fertility exists that's about, on average, three to five days. So again, this luteal phase, it's infertile. You can't ever, ever get pregnant outside of this window of fertility that exists. Once the egg is out, it's absolute infertility from that point. Um, and again, if you understand when you ovulate, if you can track that, then you're always going to know when your period starts. So these are kind of the key points to take away from understanding your cycle. You only ovulate once in a cycle, never more than once. Can you release more than one egg? Yes, that does happen in non-identical twins. Actually, it can happen you can release three eggs. But it's rare. I mean, most of the time, just release one egg, and actually your ovaries will train. Go back to four. One left, one right is typical. You are only capable of getting pregnant in a very short window of each cycle. On average, that's around three to six days, three to five days. Your egg is only alive for about 12 to 24 hours once it is released from the ovary. And that, again, the reason why it's lengthened that fertile window is because of cervical mucus and the ability of sperm to survive in it, and your temperature. Is um, jumps up after ovulation about a full half degree until the start of your next period. So, what are the parameters that make your menstrual cycle normal so that you know how to determine if your cycle is normal or not normal? So, again, average cycle length is about 21 to 35 days. So, if you're below 21, that's not normal. If you're above 35, probably not normal. Now, if it's just one cycle that that happens, that's one thing. But if you're running your cycle is either below 21 on average or above 35, probably something not quite right about your cycle. The average flow is about four to seven days, and that includes the fact that there's a gradual increase. So the period we always say has like a crescendo, decrescendo aspect to it. And again, the amount of blood that you should lose is around six teaspoons or about up to 40 mils. That's hard to measure unless you use like a menstrual cup. Um, but on average, we would say it's typical to change a, tad, a pad or a tampon about three to six times in a day. So if on your heavy day, you're changing it quite more than that, um, like every hour to two hours, you're probably heavier than normal. And it's typical, again, to have about three to seven days of cervical mucus around the time of ovulation. So again, 21 to 35 days. Ideal is about 24 to 32. That would be kind of your ideal range. And then the length of your menstrual bleed, ideal is around three to six days. That's very normal. And looking at cervical mucus, ideal about four to eight, um, especially when you're wanting to conceive. And that range of your luteal phase that we mentioned is so stable, needs to be ideally about 12 to 13 days 
I'll give you a little bit more, but there's a range of 11 to 16. So if you're consistently out of these parameters, then there may be a reason to check in with the healthcare provider and see what's going on. So important things to remember. So the common cause of abnormal periods is abnormal ovulation, right? Because ovulation is the main event. It's what is causing everything to happen in your entire menstrual cycle. So what makes a cycle abnormal is the abnormal event of ovulation. For example, the most obvious thing is, is if you don't ovulate, you don't have periods. So a common condition called polycystic ovarian syndrome, which a lot of young women have and has been increasing over the years, Women who have PCOS don't ovulate frequently. And so they often skip their periods and don't have them for many months. There are doctors that are trained in restorative and holistic women's health, but many doctors are not trained in this. So they often recommend birth control or synthetic hormones to suppress natural ovulation as a way to kind of band-aid over what they think the problem is. But this is a simple band-aid fix. It doesn't restore or cure or give you any answers on why your period was off to begin with. And so it disrupts the natural function of your body. And we'll talk about that a little bit more. So these are some things like, if you have these, these definitely warrant maybe a call to your doctor. So again, if you're having abnormal lengths in your cycle, you're skipping or you're having periods more than twice in a month, um, would be a reason to see if your menstrual flow is very light or if it's very heavy, and specifically if you're not having at least one medium day of flow, um, that might require a, a look at what's going on, or if you're changing the pad every one to two hours or less. If your menses last less than two days, or if it goes longer than seven days, particularly longer than 10 days, if you're experiencing any excessive pain, cramping, nausea, vomiting during your period, like you have to stay home from class because your period is so painful, that's not normal. A lot of women don't understand that um, what they're experiencing is, is not what everybody else is experiencing. We can kind of often be like, well, I guess everybody probably has periods like I do. But if you're staying home, if you get to the point where you're nauseous and you're vomiting with your period and you have to miss um, you know, events and it affects your daily functioning, that's not normal. And if you have really, really bad PMS. I mean, the type of PMS that lasts for more than a couple of days and causes incredible quality of life problems with mood swings, depression, irritability, severe fatigue, breast pain, insomnia, bloating, weight gain. This is also a sign of hormonal dysfunction and actually can be evaluated and treated as well. Um, these are just some other kind of, again, changes. Um, I'll just let you kind of quickly read those and keep going. Physical and emotional changes 
and they can last up to a, a week to even 10 days, even 14. Um, most women who experience what I would call normal PMS, they have it for a couple days. And that's normal because our hormones are kind of crashing down. So we can feel kind of cranky on one day, and you know, if there's just a day we're off. But when it happens and it's longer than a week, it's really not normal. So it's normal to have some mild cramping, it's normal to have you know, some irritability and fatigue, but there's also natural stuff that you can do. Water is super important. These are just kind of general health lifestyle things. Your body 75% water. The more water you drink, the more hydrated you are, the less cramps you'll feel with hydration. Um, it's overall just going to be an important thing to stay hydrated throughout your life. It also helps you detoxify. And if you urinate, you're going to detoxify. It's just one of those things you've got to let your body sweat, all of those things. You've got to eat vegetables, and I know, I'm sure your cafeteria food is not the greatest, especially right now with COVID, but these vegetables that we get, like especially the greens, provide so many nutrients that your bodies need. So you've got to find a way to get those greens in. Four to six cups is what we're supposed to be getting, and most of us really fail to get that on a daily basis. Um, the protein content is really low for a lot of women. And this can be, again, just part of the fact of what's available to you, but the more protein your body gets, the more stable your blood sugars are. And with PMS especially, if your blood sugar is like this and this, you feel that. And what protein does is it prevents your insulin levels from spiking so your blood sugar can stay more stable. So getting protein in is super important. just more getting off sugar. So I always like to say like sugar is the problem, not fat. When I was growing up in the 1990s, like there was this whole phenomenon around that fat was bad and, and everything started to be low fat, with snack well cookies, and that has been a disaster for health. Um, fat is not bad. Fat is what makes your hormones work. Fat is what is important as a building block for all hormones. And so if you don't eat fat, you actually are going to be suffering from a deficiency in so many ways. It's sugar that is the problem. It's sugar that's causing obesity and chronic disease. And so the more foods that you eat that are carbohydrate-based, um, you're going to, over a period of time, lend yourself towards chronic disease. And I can't say enough about this. So getting off of any excess sugar, any starchy foods, processed foods, box foods, all of those things, over your life, you're going to be a healthier person overall. Vitamin D is the other kind of soapbox I have. Almost every college student that I've ever tested who doesn't take vitamin D as a supplement is extremely deficient. Um, and although the sunshine is super important for vitamin D, even being out in the sun oftentimes does not make it possible to get enough vitamin D. So you might want to talk to a healthcare provider about testing your level or getting on a supplement is generally needed for most people. Um, exercise is super important. They've done studies on exercise and dysmenorrhea, which is painful periods, and it was found to be effective at relieving dysmenorrhea. Um, and we know that it actually improves our energy, our um, happy chemicals, we call them, or endorphins. So exercise, of course, is super important, especially around your menstrual cycle. And even like the women's um, soccer team, the national women's soccer team now, I don't know if you guys have heard this, but they actually track their cycles, um, the national women's um, soccer team, and they change their diet and fitness program around their menstrual cycle. The coach, who's a male, um, had the women's soccer team start doing this to improve their performance. And so they track their cycles and they change their carbohydrates or proteins and everything around where they are in their menstrual cycle. So I think that's super awesome. Okay, have you ever skipped a period? Has anybody ever skipped a period before? Has it been when you've been super stressed out? Or maybe you're an athlete and you're, you're high intensity training? So it's normal in the woman's body to skip periods under extreme stress. Why does this occur? Well, it's a protective mechanism. And what originally occurred as your fertility pacemaker that's sending out that signal every 60 to 120 minutes, that stressful event it disrupts your pacemaker. And it tells the body that at that moment, you're not capable of taking care of a human being that you possibly would create. And so it tells the body to suppress ovulation for that period of time.
And so you won't have a period because, again, what causes a period? What's the main event of the cycle? Ovulation. So it's a protective mechanism. So if you skip a cycle and you were stressed out, it's okay. Now, if your cycle never comes back, that's a problem. But if you skip a cycle because of a stressful event, that's typical. Now, some people will have, there's an athletic, athletic triad, um, or what they call the female triad, that can occur when women start really exercising heavily, they start losing weight, um, and that will disrupt the pacemaker significantly. And I've had women go for years without periods because they just put so much physical stress on the body, it's really hard to get that pacemaker up and back firing again. So those can be difficult to work with. You can get it back, but um, it's, it's why it's so important to maintain balance in life as a woman and not put your body through extreme periods of stress, um, even from a, like a weight standpoint. Okay, so the intersection between birth control and health. Okay, so birth control, again, I mean, we all know this, it's recommended for pretty much everything. PCOS, PMS, painful periods, ovarian cysts, pretty much everything, irregular periods. Over 12 million women in the U.S. are on oral contraceptives. 60% of those women are likely on it because of a health reason, not because they went in and asked for birth control, but birth control reasons. So it's often what doctors are, you know, we come in, you've got a problem, here's my fix for you, is the birth control pill. But it doesn't really fix anything. So it's a common problem, this issue of you know, going to a doctor and having birth control prescribed. It will only temporarily relieve whatever your period problem is. It does not fix any underlying issue. And you always have to ask the question, and this is where, as women, you advocate for yourself, right? You went to the doctor and you had, let's say you skipped your period for six months, and he said, well, okay, well, why don't you just go on birth control? This will regulate your period. Ask the doctor, well, I'd like to know why my periods are irregular to begin with. I'd like to find out what the underlying root problem is before I just take a medication. What does the birth control pill do? Well, what it does is it puts your body into a state of potentially what we call like a pseudo-pregnancy because it, it, it gives your body a steady state of high synthetic hormones. So it tells the body that nothing's going on, you're pregnant, and so it stops ovulation. So it's a very unnatural way for the body to exist on hormonal birth control, um, and it stops the natural ovulatory process. And again, there's not a real solution to the problem. When you come off of the birth control, your problem will still be there. So important thing to remember, hormonal birth control cannot cure a woman's health issue. It can provide symptom relief, um, or what you know, is causing the disruption of the menstrual cycle. But there are many cooperative and restorative ways to treat the underlying cause of women's health issues, but you must seek out a healthcare provider um, that knows this, they're less common, and you must learn the language of your body so you can be a strong advocate for what you believe is best for your body and for the woman. So it's about, again, your choice to decide what is best for what you put in there. So how do I turn this fertility kind of education into like practical use now? Okay, so, all of us at this point then, like, what do I do with this? How many of you already track your cycle on your, like, phones? Awesome. So you're already, like, the first step in. So you're what we, I would call cycle tracking. Um, how many of you recognize that your phone tries to tell you when you ovulate? How many of you actually put in biological information about what your body is doing to determine ovulation? Okay, so that you've already come so far. So there's, there's this, you know, most women that I'm meeting right now that are about your age, they, they are, they're, they're tracking, they're cycle tracking, they put their information, this menstrual um, period, the start of my period, in, and maybe they're tracking, you know, their emotions. Um, but the, the next step is to getting to the point where you're fertility tracking, where you're actually inputting more information. Um, it's, it's bigger than, of course, just putting in the period. So the key is, is you can do this on your menstrual tracking app, and I'm not an expert at menstrual tracking apps and which ones are the best. I do know the vast majority of them are not meant to determine your fertile window. They're just glorified rhythm of the apps, meaning that you put your period in, it tells you based on retrospective data when it thinks your body's going to do this thing called ovulation. So they're, what, they're glorified rhythm methods. But if you actually want to, you can chart 
your biological information. And that just means starting to pay attention and to track the signs of your body, right? And of course, again, this easy symptom of mucus, for the most part, um, you can track on a daily basis. So it's about being consistent and trying to put that information in there. What are we trying to, to, to track? Well, we're tracking either the sensation or the fact that mucus is present and what it looks like. Maybe it's clear. Maybe, um, you know, in Craig model, there's actually testing of it, finger testing of it. You don't have to do that, but some people do. But most of the time when the mucus is it's so present, it feels slippery. So there's definitely a sensation there of wetness and slipperiness. Um, some women might ask the question, why have mucus all the time? So what does that mean? And, and that's true. There are women that have mucus all the time. So how do you chart that when you have mucus all the time? Well, even if you have mucus all the time, I guarantee you that the mucus at the point when your estrogen rises is going to be different. Because the mucus you make on a daily basis is usually what we call like, I call it like junk in the sense that it's tacky or it's yellow or it's kind of gummy or whatever. It's not the same as it is when you're going to ovulate. When you ovulate, it's going to be this clear stuff. And it's, it's, it's heavier, it's wetter, it's, it's, um, there's definitely that change. And that's what you're going to be looking for there. So again, you can look for these and you can chart them in your charting. And then the best time of the day, of course, is just when you're in the bathroom, when you're wiping, and trying to determine that sensation, especially when you wipe from front to back across the perineum, which is right at the back of the vagina. Um, and if it feels dry and you don't see anything, then likely you're in a dry period. Okay, and you always just remember that your phone cannot predict ovulation. This is just really important, because I so often ask girls, you know, can you tell me when you ovulate? Oh yeah, it's gonna tell me when I'm ovulating or coming up here next week. Unless you feed on your phone, your phone cannot tell you that. It's only your body that can tell you to ovulate. And actually, only 14% of women actually ovulate on day 14 in a given cycle. So it's not accurate to just guess that your body is going to ovulate on day 14. Only your body can tell you that information. So it is you inputting the actual signs of your body that tells us when you're going to lose that day. Um, the organization FACTS, which there are some postcards for the FACTS organization, they actually released a study that determines which apps actually can be used to determine the fertile window. So if you want to actually know which apps do, you can go to the FACTS study that was done in 2015 or 2017, and they only found nine apps out of 100 that predict a fertile window with accuracy. So there's a lot of mystery tracking. Okay, so with you, you can track your fertility signs each and every cycle and track the emotions if you want that go with it. And then the key is just trying to get into a pattern with it. It's really hard at the beginning to, like, any, anything to establish a habit in tracking. Because, you know, it's one thing if you just remember to put your period in, but to have to track every day is a whole other routine. But once you get into the routine of it, then it just becomes like tying your shoes, just doing it every day. Um, and again, so you're watching for that mucus. And if you determine that point when that mucus stops, I guarantee you, you can determine when your period is going to start. So you can actually be super accurate in knowing the day your period is going to start by actually collecting this data um, and watching it. Okay, so just a, a short, and we're almost done here, so thank you for your patience. Um, these are the fertility tracking methods that are basically scientifically proven to determine the fertile window and can be used as a way to either achieve or avoid pregnancy. So these are what I call natural fertility methods, sometimes called natural family planning, um, a lot of times now called fertility awareness-based methods. I like to call it natural fertility methods. So these involve various ways to naturally track fertility through direct observation of the cycle without the need for any artificial hormones, without implanting anything in your uh, body, without using any um, barrier methods, anything like that. These methods are used um, by women in order to either achieve or avoid pregnancy. They're reliable and effective, and the woman's able to make these accurate observations with education. These are you know, very uh, scientifically reviewed, and they use resources, tools with it. They're in fact also focused on health as well, like the Creighton Model System. Again, the one that's developed at the place that I work, the Politics Institute, is developed a whole woman's health science so the charting can be used to diagnose and treat underlying women's health issues. So the pros of using a method like this, you get to know your body, of course, as a woman. It's true empowerment as a woman to know this information. 
And your awareness about your body and cycles allow you to be an early advocate for your health. So now, like just knowing this, you actually can be your first and foremost advocate. Your cycle is a vital sign of your health. Your relationship will now be focused on true intimacy and self-mastery, which strengthens marriage. We know that. We've studied that. Your body will be healthier by avoiding harmful chemicals and devices. And a major study found that most men and women say that a natural fertility method improves their sex life. 95% of women say a natural fertility method makes them know their body better. And men and women say it improves their relationship. The downside of using the natural method is that if you are trying to avoid pregnancy or having a baby, you will not be able to have sex when you are most biologically wired to. So again, coming back to that whole men and women in the bar thing, there's a reason why we make pheromones and why there's this chemical attraction, because God wanted to make sure that there was human beings on the earth for thousands of years. So he made us chemically designed to be attracted to each other at the time, of course, of being impossible. So when using a natural method, you're wired, of course, in, in, in the way that our body works and are designed to desire that at the time, you know, when a baby is possible. So if you're avoiding pregnancy, then you're abstaining from sex during that time. So it takes a really good education and training and motivation and consistency to be able to use the natural method, but um, hundreds, thousands of couples do this on a daily basis. And these are the natural methods. Symptotherm, where you use the mucus and your body temperature. Um, Creighton method. Oh, and these are the effectiveness. You can see, like, these methods that have been studied are highly effective and just as effective as the pill um, or condom. In fact, it's usually better than the barrier method. Um, the Marquette method is now increasingly popular right now, and then that's the method where you can use these LH strips and, you know, use these urinary markers to determine your fertility. So many couples are using the Marquette method. The Creighton model system is what I'm trained in. It's a mucus method only. It works extremely effectively. And all of this just is to say that, yes, at this point, maybe you're tracking for health reasons, but at the point you're using this for family planning, you really need an educator. You need someone to train you. Because it's not going to give you this level of effectiveness to just go out on your own and try to wing it. Um, and that, that doesn't work. <laughs> I've definitely met women and men who have done that trying to wing it with just information they're trying to pull together from the internet, from books and things like that. This is where you actually want to use a very um, scientific method to plan a family. And again, these are just a little bit more about those methods too. The Billings ovulation method is also a mucus only method. It was developed off of the Creighton model system, um, or I should say the Creighton model system was developed from the Billings ovulation method. And um, again, the Marquette method, the symptothermal, these are the most common ones that I'll go to and study. And this is my information. So I know, again, that was a lot of information, but if you have questions and, or personal questions and I don't get to talk to you tonight, you know, here's my information. You can always reach out to me. It's on my postcard too. And I encourage you, of course, to listen to the podcast because um, in a much funner way, we go through a lot of this information and we address issues like PCOS, PMS, um, it just taped an episode on endometriosis. Um, and so we, we try to give you all of this information to empower you so again, you can make better decisions about your own health. Um, so I'd love it if you guys had any questions that you would like to um, ask at this point and I can answer them. Yeah. When do I go to an OBGYN and like do I ever have to have a pelvic exam? And that sounds super scary and uncomfortable. Um, so those are really good questions. Um, so a mammogram, let's just start with that. A mammogram is a um, it's basically a radiological test to, to determine if you have breast cancer. And women, for the most part, do not start mammograms until the age of 40. So for most of you, that'll be a while off. Unless your relative, like your mother, sister, or grandmother, had breast cancer at an early age, and usually that means 50 or less. And if that was the case, there are times that mammograms are done earlier. But what about like going to an OBGYN? Um, and do I need a pap smear? Um, a pap
pap smear, so you, it's a test specifically for cervical cancer, and it's a collection of cells, or we just brush the cells on the face of the cervix to, to test for this. And most of the time, um, it's unnecessary to do a pap smear um, in younger women unless they're already sexually active. So for example, I might have a 22, 23 year old girl come to me who has never been what I would say genitally or sexually active at all. And I would say, you don't need a pap smear. Why? Because the virus that causes cervical cancer is called human papillomavirus, otherwise known as HPV, which you might have heard of. And HPV is pretty much the single and foremost cause of cervical cancer. So the best thing to do, I always say, to avoid a pelvic exam is to avoid having sex until you're married because then you won't have to have a pap smear before then. Um, but there are times, you know, when, you know, if you have been genitally active, which is common and, and it does happen, by the age of 21, if you have, then we do start pap smears, but usually not before 21. So 21 is the magic age for pap smears, and again, unless you haven't been sexually active, it actually can be delayed even longer than that. And a lot of times I encourage young women who are engaged, maybe to come in and see me, maybe they've been abstinent before marriage, um, but they're engaged to be married, I'll oftentimes say, come on in and see me, and let's do a pelvic exam, why? Because I can oftentimes head off a lot of first marriage you know, issues, um, by making sure everything's gonna be okay. And that really, uh, I found that it can be really helpful rather than kind of waiting and seeing what happens um, you know, on your honeymoon and then finding out things maybe didn't work so well. So I oftentimes say, if you are engaged and you've never had a pelvic exam, it's, it's a good idea to come to a provider like me who's very sensitive to that, which unfortunately, like I said, may not be the case. If you can go to a female, um, especially someone trained in that way, or holistic women's health obviously can do so much better if we have a particular sensitivity. Good question. Mm -hmm. Here, we were just talking about looking for providers that are like more sensitive towards our holistic view of women's health. My question is kind of what are like some other things to look for when looking for like gynecologists or OBGYN that can help you? Yeah, so so you know if you want to know like who is out there that I know of that can help you with this, there is a list of doctors who have been trained in natural technology on a website called fertilitycare.org. That website is associated with the Cole Pelvic Six Institute. It's all the doctors who have been trained um, by the Cole Pelvic Six Institute to do you know this more um, restorative care or what we call natural technology. So that may be helpful because some of you might be from states all around the country and you might wonder if there's a doctor in your state that could help you. Um, but I would say, you know, if you go to an OBGYN and all they keep telling you is, I mean, maybe you walk in and you're like, they say, okay, well, you need a pap smear, you're 21, and you're like, huh, well, I haven't really been sexually active at all, can I push that off? But all they keep telling you is, no, that's not possible, you should just get a pap smear now. Like, if they don't believe you, number one, which can happen, if they, they don't seem to believe you, um, if all they do is push birth control on you, at every left turn you take in terms of what you're telling them, which is common, then that's probably someone who's not gonna listen to you. You know, what you deserve in a healthcare provider is someone who first and foremost listens to your problem. And if they dismiss you and they just say, well, you know, you just need this, then you don't have really a healthcare provider that's on your team. Because, you know, if it's me, like I just wanna, help you get to the goals and the health that you want in your life. How do we meet those goals together? It should be teamwork, you know, as a healthcare provider and as a patient. Does that kind of answer your question or is there something else I missed? I thought it was. No, that helps, thank you. Mm -hmm. and I'll tell you a story. This is, I was at the SLS conference, um, the Focus Missionaries. Um, let's see, that was, two years ago, one year ago, two years ago. Um, and it was a huge conference. And I was at the Guiding Star Project booth. Have you ever heard of the Guiding Star Project? Another great holistic women's health. Follow the Guiding Star, they're awesome. And I'm on their national board. And I had hundreds of women coming up just wanting to ask questions about their bodies and um, how this whole thing works. What are you offering? Do you have this other way of treating women's health? And 
There was one particular girl that came up to me after I did a short little class like this, and she had been put, you know, put on birth control at 14. She told me that her mom literally took her to the OBGYN at the age of 14, walked her into the doctor's office and said, my daughter needs to be on birth control, put her on, and that was it. No questions, no problems with her period, and she was just put on birth control at 14. And she's standing in front of me at 21, 2021, and she looked at me after I told her all this information about her body and her cycle, and she's like, do you think I can go off of this now? And I said, oh, I said, honey, you're like, of course you can. Like, let it go. If, if it's not what you wanted, again, she had no idea, one, how it was working in her body. She had no idea it was her choice or her freedom to choose to put that in her body or not put that in her body. And then she just wept. It's so sad to me that women get put on these medicines at an early age. They have no idea what they're doing in their bodies. And they have, they have no reason to stop, apparently, because they think the doctor told them to do it, and it must be good for me. And it's actually probably not good for you to take long-term. Um, in fact, I know it's not. So it was very sad to me. But that conference, after I had been there and we were at this SLS, there was an OBGYN clinic, a Catholic clinic. They got 11 calls that weekend. Um, I think three of them were to take IUDs out. Um, a couple of them were infertility, and another, like, multiple ones were people that just wanted off birth control and wanted to chart their cycle. Women are really hungry for this information, but they don't know who to go to, you know, after they learn about it. And so that's why we have to get more doctors trained in it. And so, you know, anybody out here that's seen it in the medical profession or nursing, like, you guys take on the next charge because you get to decide, again, where we go with this and what it's helped in our culture. Yes? Thank you. I think I saw your poster. Are you teaching the FEM? Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, so talk to Olivia. I know FEM um, does a great job. They are, you know, focused on health and reaching young women and learning to chart the cycle. So that's awesome. Um, so I did see that, Olivia. Thank you for being here. I really appreciate you guys' time. I know that wasn't the most exciting presentation of all time. It was a lot of information. I hope it was helpful to you. Um, I'll stick around if you have any like, personal questions or if you have more questions you want to ask, I'll stay and I'm happy to answer them for you. So thanks, guys. Is this on? Okay, I'm just going to yell. <laughs> um, you guys all got this little pre-survey, post-survey when you came in. If you guys could flip it over. First off, if you haven't filled out the first part, Oh. Ooh, this is fun. Wait, hello. Oh, they're trying. Oh, sweet. Okay. So if you guys fill out the first part, if you could do that really briefly, um, it's the side that says pre-survey with a little flower on the front, or vine. And then if you could just take a couple of minutes to fill out 